Welcome to the Water Table Podcast. Today I am at Iowa State University and I have Jacob Hansecker from Hands On Excavating and Bob Lepper. Bob started way back when with uh, Bob Leffer excavating and Bob happened to be the guy that got Jacob into the business and uh, excited to just have a conversation, kind of how, how this all began. Welcome guys. Thanks Jamie. Thank you. Jacob, you kind of started working with Bob in high school, right? And kind of tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I got to uh, skip a lot of days of school to go go work with Bob. So <laughs> dad was fine with it. Mom, maybe not so much. But no, Bob uh, was just the the local local excavating contractor. And, and my dad had worked with him uh, hauling asphalt and stuff when when times were a little slower on the farm growing up. And, and then the start of the hog building era, I was... Uh, I, I'd go run dozer for him, and, and uh, we built some grain bins down in Nevada. Did uh, did some packing down there. It's kind of kind of funny that that the grain bins that we built down there, we uh, over the last few years we've added storage to that same site and and built additional storage for for those guys on the on the dirt work side of things. So um, long long term uh, good good clients to work with and. And thankful that Bob was help Bob was able to help us get started. Sure, sure. Tell us a little bit about your history before before Jacob, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> well, BC. <laughs> yeah. Um, graduated high school in 1978 from Radcliffe, and uh, my brother had just completed uh, building trades course at DMAC, and so I went to work for him carpentry you know eventually we got to where we were building houses and and things but we were we were doing the whole the whole concept you know of uh, the basements and you know everything and I started in uh, bought my first machine in 1981 and uh, had known obviously growing up on a farm you run every kind of machine you know that you that's on the farm and we didn't have any excavating machinery, but tractor, loaders, blades, you know, so on. We did have an old little uh, three-point mounted backhoe, could fix a tile, dig yeah. out a rock, yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. But then when I started being around the construction industry more, we'd, get, we'd he, my brother would hire guys to dig the basements and do the finished grading. And I got to watch and I said, you know, I think I can do that. And so I just... Just borrowed a little money in 1981 and bought an old old crawler loader, a dump truck with a tag trailer. And I, I was in business. Yeah, yeah. You know? So I ended up uh, selling out that company in 2000. We moved to Missouri for a while. I went into real estate down at Branson, Missouri. Jim, Jacob's dad, called me in 08, and he said, uh, he said, well, I was just wondering, you had a certain kind of excavator when you quit. I was wondering if they were good machines. And I said, yeah, yeah, it was a good machine. He said, well, there's one coming up on an auction. And uh, so he said, well, I think we're going to bid on it. And if we get that bought, would you be available to come up and show the boys how to run it? I said, yeah, real estate had slowed down. 08 and 09 were bad times you know, yeah, in real yeah. estate. So I had time on my hands. And uh, so they got it bought in, the, I believe it was in the fall of the year, if I remember right. And so I went up there, and, and Jim had lined up something, a demolition of corn crib or... It was a corn crib at our house. At your place? Yeah. Okay. Started there, and, uh, you know, then it was wintertime. And in the next spring, <clears throat> Jim wanted to continue and uh, started looking for jobs, you know, to do around the area. Just all the same stuff I used to do, just general ag excavating stuff. And uh, he called it Radcliffe Excavating. Remember that? Yeah, that was the name of it. Hmm. And then uh, pretty soon there was dozer and backhoes, scrapers, and I was there then full time for probably six years, six, years. six or seven years. You know, and then came the tiling. I, I was talking with him one day, and I said, you know, you've got everything here except a plow, mm -hmm. and I think you can make good money in mm -hmm. farm drainage. Yeah. You know, you got the people, you got all this other equipment. So they picked up that first uh, 
trailing wheel plow, put it behind a quad track, and we pulled a lot of tile. Cool. Then did you uh, did you move back up to Iowa then? Went during that time frame or no? I was I was bouncing back and forth. Yeah. Our, our family farm is still just yeah. five miles away from their family farm. Sure. And there's two houses there, my grandparents' old house, and so I would stay in that. I'd come up for a couple of weeks, stay in that, go home for a week or sometimes less to Branson, and just did that for quite a you know quite a few years. Sure. Tell me a little bit about you, Bob, before. Um, when you from that 1981 to 2000, what kind of kind of opportunities were you seeing, and you know how did your business grow? Just curious, as a lot of our listeners are business owners. There wasn't that much um, internet ways, you know, if any, I don't know back then. And if there was, I wouldn't have known how to do it to advertise. So you know, some newspaper ads and things, and just basically word of mouth. It can be your best friend or your worst friend. It just depends on, you know, how it works out. But, but I had to, I had a good following of customers in that in the Hardin County area. Um, was digging all my my brother went on then to move down to Ames, and he began building big homes. Yeah. But he had a good career, so I did all his excavating work, and like I say, all the farm stuff. And I wasn't actually tiling per se in those years, but tile repairs. Sometimes you have to back back hoe in a new short spur, or this or that, and and that kind of thing. But I didn't, and I didn't have the help to actually run a tiling company. You know, most most of the time I was working alone, and you know, like Jacob part time and a couple other guys, and and so just did all that kind of stuff. A lot of building pads and bin pads, like he talked about. Um, had an opportunity to go out to Idaho and put in some. Prince Gold Dual Wall. Really? Yeah. At a, um, there's a family there at Hubbard, not far from my home there, and their one son uh, went out to Idaho and got into the sawmill business. Hmm. And he is he he actually came to my place one day, and I, he was older than me, and I did, I never had met him, but he introduced himself and he said, you know, we got a terrible mess out there when these log trucks come in. They're they're so heavy. They're they're sinking in our yards. In the, especially the spring of the year. Mm-hmm. And he said, then we've got these big forklifts and they're leaving huge tracks. And he said, I just wonder if there's anything, you know, that what could we do to dry up this ground? And so I think I got some pictures from him and this and that and finally decided that it would probably be a good opportunity to try and tile it. And I was actually talking with a competitor of mine and about this, and we had this scheme worked up where we were going to put his tiling machine on a on a on a train, and rail it out to uh, out to Idaho. We flew out there to actually get on the site, and we really realized right away you're not going to plow anything because all the years of tromping big branches into that mud with those machines. That I've got a picture somewhere of me standing in one of those tracks up to my waist. These were huge monsters of four-wheel drive rubber tire forklifts that would pull into those log trucks and pick the whole thing up and back away and go. And now nah, we're not going to get anywhere with a tile plow. So we then got a truckload of six-inch dual-wall tile, mm-hmm. and they had a guy come with an excavator. At that point, I was pretty much a supervisor for that and tiled that thing out. And it was very successful. Bedded the tile with one inch clean. And then across the road, they owned land. There was a big rock hill. And they got a guy in there to dynamite that. And we had shot rock to fill the rest of the ditch Mm -hmm. all the way up to the top. And the next year, he stopped by again. I thought, oh, no. (laughs) And uh, he said, you know, that that lot was as dry as it's ever been in the years that I've owned that. That's that, pretty neat. Where the, was it? Where was that night all? Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Okay, all way up north. And yeah. I think he went on then. That owner of that, I think he kind of assisted in other other yards, sure. With this system of sure of a, a header line and then six inch. Sure. That was that was a good experience. Yeah. So this is your chance here on live deal here. Uh, <laughs> was Jacob your best employee? Absolutely. As you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On time. Yeah. Yeah, I could tell him tell him about something, and he'd, and he'd, he'd just, do it. And, yeah, he'd yeah. soak it up like a sponge. And, yeah. yeah. 
Oh, no no one on the water table surprised about that, but I wanted to yeah. see if we could get yeah, something interesting. I tried to get him to work full time, or at least we kicked it around, but he wanted to go to college. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. and then went. and then you kind of you know, talked a little bit. I think Jacob mentioned it in his kind of start here, but a uh, little bit about the the hog um, boom, you know, yeah, when, and, yeah. and did you get involved in that yeah. kind of when you're, yeah. did, did were you that. doing site work or what were you, what were you Dig, doing? Digging with? the pits for, you know, okay. digging the hole for the, for the concrete pits. Yeah. Did a lot of hog stuff. Also did a, a lot of those, those years, the eighties was when the super fund was out there for cleaning up the underground mm-hmm. storage tank contamination. Okay. So I got certified in that and did a lot of that. All over the state of Iowa. Sure, sure. And wasn't that um, that boom in the in the hog industry really the epicenter of that kind of where you guys are located there? Yeah. The beginning yeah. of it. Oh yeah. Iowa Select is right in that area, mm-hmm. right? And yeah, yeah. Yeah. The the one I can remember when I on one of the projects was running dozer um, pushing away when Bob would throw it out with the with the excavator. You can stand on top of that hill and look around and see several hundred hog buildings so hmm. we're, we're right in the center of it all so. yeah so you know just kind of interesting more than part of the story probably but it's part of your story but uh the way i understand it bob is you did some family things want to tell us about that like what your family was up to after you left iowa um okay well I, i'm just curious and and i read about it and i thought that's neat uh, yeah before we moved to branson in 2000 uh, several years before that, my wife and the two kids got started singing. It was just, you know, a fun thing to do, family family thing, and and it got to be more and more. And so, you know, traveling farther out and longer and stuff, and I was trying to run. The last year, in 99, um, we did 150 concerts. Really? And I was still running the business. And I said, you know, guys, <laughs> this old body is not going to take this much more. So we got to decide what, and left it up to the kids. And they said, we want to go full time. So we sold out, moved to Branson, Missouri, and traveled out of there five or six years full time all over the United States. Mm-hmm. And I was in between that, I was doing some real estate, buying and selling some fixer up, fixer upper houses and that kind of thing. Sure. And that that went on till till o o eight when Jim called, or you know, and then in, by o o nine or ten, I was up here pretty much all the time. How old were your kids during that time when they were? Oh, well, they were when when we started. The kids were uh, seven and nine. Okay. Yeah, and my my wife has been singing all of her life and very very good with harmonies. Yeah. Taught him to sing harmony, driving down the road in the car, playing tra- tra- uh, cassette tapes, yeah. and uh, they picked up the harmony, which was the nucleus of what they did, you know, sure. close harmony stuff. And sure. <clears throat> so that's that's how all that started, and we ended it was because they got old enough that they wanted to have kind of their own life, make their own yeah. way, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, understood. But it was a good experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything because of what it did for the kids because we left the what you call the product table in that in- industry the CDs uh the whatever you had to sell on your product table we left it up to the kids that was their thing you just tell us what you need me to order and you know we'll get it but you guys arrange it you guys deal with the public there after the concerts you sell it keep track of all the books and <clears throat> today they're both Entrepreneurs, they both got their own businesses doing well, and I and I think a lot of that be, is because of that training, that opportunity. They learn to meet any age person mm-hmm. and have a conversation with any age person. I told them, don't you look at the floor when somebody's talking to you. You know, you look at their eyes, you you meet them and you talk to them and you be interested in their life, and they pick that up, and I think they carried that mm-hmm. on, you know, into what they do now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great story, and I'm glad I asked that that part because that's uh, 
I just think about things that uh, I learned early on in my life yeah. and the, some of the similar. Yeah. Um, and I can remember many times where I'd be traveling with my dad and, you know, one particular one, I remember right when you were saying that of being in an airport and him saying, hey, I know that guy over there, go introduce yourself. And I'm maybe eight years old. You yeah. Know? And yeah. Um, obviously it had a profound impact on me because I'm telling it today at 52. So, um, but how that, those life lessons around meeting people and how you engage people and uh, look them in the eye and yeah. don't, don't, uh, don't shake a hand like a dish rag, you know, yeah. have a little something in your yeah. hand when you shake. So cool story. Thanks yeah. for sharing that. And I think a lot of that leads back to the premise of this discussion with, you know, how this came about with Jacob and, um, you know, some of what I see in you just helping others, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's your yeah. own kids or, or other people. So mm -hmm. Jacob, talk a little bit about, you know, some of the beginnings of that when, when yeah. you guys are working together, you have your own business, but wealth of knowledge here. And how did that, uh, how did that go from a personal standpoint? Yeah. Connecting? I mean, we, we never, never envisioned, never imagined we'd be where we're at today for sure. And, and, you know, we, we bought that excavator, uh, just like Bob said, just to kind of, kind of work around the farm and do a little bit of this and that. And I remember the conversation when we bought the tile plow that, well, we'll, we'll maybe do enough tile for, for some other people, just, just enough that we can, you know, take the edge off tile in all our own farms. And, well, our, our, I can kind of the cobbler's kids have no shoes. It's a, it's a <laughs> lot of that situation that we've done a, a, some of our farms, but it it really uh, it really blew up, and and we were able to go out there and with with Bob's leadership and guidance that that we were we did things right from the get go, and and Bob having the the reputation that he did uh, in the in our home area, like, like he said, he grew up five miles away from where my dad grew up, um, and families and known each other our whole lives and, and everything. And, and having that consistency that, that these, these farmers weren't, uh, weren't out there hiring Radcliffe excavating with, you know, a couple, a couple kids that just graduated from college not too long ago. And, and they're just trying to find their way. They've, they've got the guidance and that really, that, that took us leaps and bounds from where we would have been. Uh, and I, I'm sure I haven't thanked Bob enough for, for that <laughs> guidance and entrance into the, into the world of, of excavation and drainage and, and just business in general. Uh, understanding what to do and ha him having done it himself and guide us through, well, how should we build this and how should we learn, you know, how, well, we underbuild this, we need to learn to do this right next time and, and doing the change of those things and then just meant working with, with ourselves and teaching us how to do it the right way. And then as we started to add uh, employees uh, to, to help them and, and help us with, management of of employees and working alongside everybody and 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 integrating it all into into the family atmosphere that he was accustomed to as well so it's just a a big ball that we kind of shoved all together yeah yeah and there's a you know and, and everyone everyone has a story right and the story here is is probably not in some ways not unsimilar to other other things where you look back and you say, wow, that, you know, those pieces actually fit together or that actually mm -hmm. worked that mm -hmm. way. But on the other hand, you know, this story is pretty unique because you just don't see it happen yeah. that way very often. I, one of the things I enjoyed about that whole arrangement was watching somebody else mm -hmm. learn. You know, I'm, I, just, I just thought that was cool. Yeah. You know? And younger, younger people that are. Yeah. That yeah. are passionate. And yeah, and they watching. had the they had the passion to do it, and and they learned quick, and uh, I just thought that was cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bob, what kind of advice do you have for not necessarily Jacob? You probably given him all your advice already, but uh, <laughs> for younger people that are, you know, wanting to wanting to be entrepreneurs and wanting to do things on their own, you you got to have the passion, mm -hmm. you know. And I'll, I always looked at it as a long game, you know, not get rich quick. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and climb a ladder or whatever. Um, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in dirt the rest of my life. 
And so that's that's what I did. A lot of hours. There was nights when in the in the eighties there, nineties, work all day, get done with a job. Of course the sun don't go down to nine o'clock. So between nine and ten o'clock, I'm back to the shop to get the low boy and go load the dozer or backhoe, move it to the next site so I can be out there six o'clock the next morning and start digging when the sun comes up. Your season is relatively short. Not this year, no. oh. <laughs> but normally. And so it didn't take summer vacations for 15 years, you know. Do something in the winter when the ground's froze. And uh, it takes that passion. Any business, but most, both of my kids, as I said, are in business and they do the same things. The hours are endless, but their businesses are growing. And it's not work when you're enjoying it and having fun. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jacob, kind of same question. You're on a little different spectrum and right in the middle of your career, but, yeah. you know, how do you think about that? What would you tell? The biggest thing I would say is for the, that I would say has benefited us is is be looking for the, the ways to improve, the ways that it doesn't, doesn't – it's not always going to be done the way it's always been done. Uh, and especially, you know, you look at from where we started – just the technology that has come about with with drainage and excavators and and dozers and 3D guidance and uh, design and just everything. There's not an industry out there that's sitting stagnant. Um, they're all changing, yeah. but the amount of of brain power that's being put into agriculture and drainage um, and know and know what your customers want. Yeah, in drainage, especially designing those those full scale maps and showing the client this is this is what I want to do and this is how we should do it and and not not just because it's always been done but this is what the science says and and to learn that and be very very capable of of disseminating that information to your client and your customer and and to and be willing to help other people out, you know, be part of peer groups and be, you know, we, we don't have to be in the, the drainage industry world. I'm sure there's a lot of people listening to this that, that are, you know, are friends that I consider friends and, and many more that acquaintances. And we all kind of, we all kind of live in the same world here and, and be able to be willing to reach out and ask questions and when asked the question, offer that advice. So be willing to adapt and and change and and try new things. Yeah, you know I think I think in probably in all industries, but you know, get in our industry and you figure something out and you get better at it, you get better at it, you get better at it. Yep. And at some point though, you kind of forget that, and you just start doing it that way. Now we've perfected it, and there's no way to do it better. And so I think it's always really important to stay curious. I know Absolutely. with me. You know, there's, I can tell you times where I haven't done that and it, it hasn't been, the results haven't been good, you know. <laughs> so staying curious or, around how we can continue to improve in all aspects of life are, at, you know, even as we get older and um, is really important. So, guys, thanks for being part of the yeah. water table today and for sharing your story. It's part of what we do is a lot of the water table is about education, but um, I think just in talking to you and about your story, there's a lot to learn from it. So thanks for being part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.